Oh, that was pretty good. Y'all were much more awake than first service was. That was good. Good worship this morning. We're glad you're here. Glad you're here with us for our uh, beginning of our Christmas series. Uh, Christmas threw up in the building, if you can't tell. Um, how many of you ate way too much turkey on Thanksgiving Day? Anybody here today too much turkey? All right, still in that, what is it, trick, trick to, trick to some, is that what you get? What do you get it from the turkey? Trick, yeah, that stuff. It makes you sleep too long. All right, well, hopefully you're over it and you're ready to learn this morning. And the kiddos are getting um, some activity bags, so if there's kids in here this morning, go get your activity bag from Miss Crystal, and uh, that'll keep you um, following along this morning, having a good time. If you're an adult, you don't need an activity bag. I am your activity bag. That didn't come out exactly the way I wanted it to, but we'll take it. All right? So I'm, I'm an old bag, and I'll be providing the activities today, so there you go. All right, so uh, there you go, all right? Um, It'll be fun. Um, Looking forward to this series this morning. We are going to be talking about different names of God that are in Scripture uh, throughout this series, so I'm looking forward to it this morning as uh, as we go through it. Um, We're going to be dealing with um, a a word out of uh, the Old Testament this morning, the Hebrew Scripture. So if you got a Bible, I'll let you go ahead and turn to it, um, to the book of Isaiah. It's a a verse you're probably familiar with. I'm only going to use one verse this morning. I'm going to be very practical, I hope, with what we're going to share this morning. And hopefully you'll learn some things and be able to use it. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 is where I'm going to be uh, sharing this morning some names of of God and how we're going to use it and what we're going to do uh, or how we're going to use that this morning. So um, one of the things that we know about uh, about God is that God knows um, everything we need. Did you know that? Okay, there we go. Good. All right. I I hate to do this to you, but I need to remind you that here at Living Water, you have to talk back when the pastor asks a question. All right? We are a loud church. If you're not loud, you have to learn to be loud. We respond when questions are asked. It's kind of like school, but you're not being graded. Um, So let's try that one more time. Do you know that God knows what you need? Do you know that God knew that you did not need that second plate on Thanksgiving Day? You did not need it. Isn't it crazy that in America we sit down to a feast of so much food and we say, Dear God, please nourish our bodies as we partake and become gluttons for the next four and a half hours on a Thursday afternoon. But it's what we do, don't we? Right? That's what we do. We, we've done it. But God knows every need we have. He knows, he knows every desire we have. He, he lives in the past. He lives in the present. And he also lives in the future. He knows everything we need. I don't know what you need. I barely know what I need. But God knows. God knows exactly what you need during this season. Now, I'm fully aware that this season can be very difficult for people. There are people that are facing this particular season with challenges this year that they never thought they would have to face. I could define them in eight or ten different ways, I'm sure, pretty easily, but I'm not going to do that this morning. You know what your challenges are. You know what your needs are. More than that, God knows what you need. And we're going to see God show up this morning in some names that a prophet that lived thousands of years ago in a prophet prophecy given to the nation of Israel, but also to us, is speaking of God and Him knowing our needs and how He can meet our needs through His names. So here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to help you find how God can meet your needs. My prayer and my hope is that by the time we end today, you're going to say, man, I needed that. Matter of fact, let's practice that together. Let's be a loud church. Can y'all be a loud church? There we go. So let's practice this, that together. We're going to go ahead and practice and we're going to say, because we're going to do this at the end of the service today. Maybe we won't do it together, but you're going to do it in your own heart. But we're going to practice right now. You ready? Here we go. Man, I needed that today. Wasn't that good? See, you already know that you needed something that's going to be said today. And you will. And I believe that God will use something that will get said today because he spoke it so long ago. 
So you got your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you and you want to look up on the screen, the notes and the verses will be up on the screen that we'll use. Again, I'm going to be very practical. If you love filling in blanks, man, are you going to be in love today? I got a bunch of blanks for you to fill in. We use our sermon notes on our church app, MyLW. You can fill in blanks. If you got a piece of paper, you can fill in stuff on the screen this morning. Whatever you want to do. Lots of just practical information. One verse, but I'm going to deal with some others as we go through it, but one verse I want us to focus on. The book of Isaiah is written by an Old Testament, a Hebrew prophet by the name of See, isn't that good? Oh, not good? Isn't it good that a guy named Bob didn't write the book of Isaiah? That, that helps us out a lot. Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is an Old Testament prophet. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. There's a lot in this book. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew scripture, has what is called major prophets and minor prophets. It doesn't mean that the minor prophets were like the munchkins on the Wizard of Oz. It just means that the minor prophets are shorter books and shorter rec- records, whereas the major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, are longer books and longer records and longer writings. Isaiah's writings is a very long book and he prophesies to the nation of Israel. A lot of it God is giving him and telling him of a lot of destruction and a lot of difficulties that are going to be coming. But right at about chapter 9 in Isaiah, God gives Isaiah this prophecy of something good that's going to be happening in the future. And he says it this way, and you're probably familiar with it if you've come to church around Christmas time every year. Look at these words that'll be up on the screen for you. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, a prophecy from Isaiah. He says this. He says, for to us, who's us? Israel and us today. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Now the government on his shoulders doesn't mean that he'll be born with government sitting on his shoulders. What it means is that all the world will ultimately rest on him. So the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. How many of you have ever heard that verse before? Put your hand up really high and say, I have heard it. Good deal. You're going to be familiar with this this morning. Depending on the translation of Bible that you have or whatever you may be reading out of, your translation may have wonderful comma, counselor. Some commentators, some theologians will try to break it down and say the word should be wonderful, counselor, mighty God, and it's fine. If you want to say wonderful, that's fine. You know what the wonderful means? Wonderful means wonderful. It means beyond beyond comprehension. It means incredible. So I'm going to say God is wonderful. But if we want to attach it to counselor, I'm going to say he's beyond comprehension as a counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. And that's the way we're going to use it today as a wonderful counselor because I'm using the NIV and that's the way that it breaks it down. Is that cool? Good. All right, good. All right, so that's how we're going to go. Now, let's get really, really practical. I am going to take these names of God that the prophet Isaiah said that this child that's going to be born, and we understand who this child is. We've lived beyond the prophecy of this child. We know who this child was. He was Jesus, born to Mary through, uh, through Joseph, not uh, through the Holy Spirit, but Joseph as his earthly father. We understand who it was, but these prophesied names of the Messiah, wonderful counselor, mighty God, ever everlasting father, prince of peace, here is my prayer. Somewhere through those names, God is going to meet a need in your life today. Are you ready? Cool. Let's pray. God, I love you. Use the words that we're going to use today. Speak to our hearts. God, I pray that you help me to stay faithful to what you've taught me. Um, God, may you get glory. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's dig in, all right? You ready for all you blank fillers, you that love to fill in blanks? Let's do this, all right? What makes him a wonderful counselor? I have been a counselor for about 30 years. I've been a pastor for about 30 years. As a pastor, as someone who counsels people, I am not a professional counselor. That means I don't have a piece of paper on the wall that says I have been certified. I'm certifiable, but I have never been certified as a counselor. I don't have a piece of paper on the wall. If you ever come to me for counseling, I will say these words to you. I have a little standard thing that I say. My name is Tony. I am a pastor. I will counsel you. I am what is known as a nuthetic counselor. Everybody say nuthetic. 
I only know that because I read it, okay? Neuthetic counselor means that I use God's word. I will counsel you out of God's word, and I will counsel you out of personal experience. I'm 53 years old. I've had a couple of experiences in my life. So I will counsel you out of God's word. I will counsel you out of experiences. So I will tell you, I counsel out of God's word. I counsel out of experience. I have a third thing that I tell people, and here it is. If you tell me anything illegal while I'm counseling you, I will call the police and turn you in. There you go. Does that sound good? Cool, now you know what I do as a counselor. Now, as a counselor, I try to empathize with people. I try to walk with people. I try to love them. I try to help them. If you have ever sat with me over a cup of coffee or if I have walked with you through any kind of a counseling environment, you know that it is part of what I love to do. It's my favorite part of pastoring is helping people. I actually get energized listening to people's struggles and helping them walk through things. So I understand what it means to be a counselor. But I can promise you I've never been called a wonderful counselor that's reserved for only one person the one that Isaiah prophesies about but what makes a wonderful counselor I think Hebrews describes what a wonderful counselor is listen to the book of Hebrews we don't know who the writer was in Hebrews and he says this he says for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet he did not sin Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I think that the wonderful counselor, our God, understands everything we need. He understands everything about us, and that's what makes him a wonderful counselor. So how do we find healing in this? By the way, that just a second ago was a really good time to say amen. You missed it. All right, so anyway, all right, so let's keep on rolling on. We're going to be loud, right? So how do we find healing from this wonderful counselor? And again, this is not necessarily stuff I'm going to yank out of Scripture. These are just practical things I want to give you this morning, stuff that I I wrote down and I want you to write down, okay? How do you find healing from this wonderful counselor? Number one, you be completely honest with the counselor. See, here's the thing about God. God can see through anything that you try to hide from. Did you know that? How many of you, when you were a kid, when you would get in bed at night and you would get scared, you would tie the blanket and you would pull it all the way up to your nose? Any any, any, any blanket nose people in here this morning? Any of you? Because you can hide from anything underneath the blanket, right? Except that God can see underneath the blanket. Now, that's scary. We need to not even think about that, all right? But God can. God can see that. God sees everything in our life. And the thing is, so many times, people will try to hide stuff from God. Can I tell you part of, my, um, part of my healing, part of God helping me from day to day and things that I walk through, even this past week, and if you're new to our church, um, a lot of times on Sundays it's kind of confessions of a screwed up pastor on Sunday mornings, and by the way, that's me, um, but, but even this last week I was confronted with somebody a, a, that into my life that I was like, man, have I really forgiven this person because they reached out to me and I was like, I don't want to, and, and have I really forgiven this person? I was like, okay, God, forgive it, forgiveness. Have I walked through this? Have I walked through this? Have I walked through this? And me and God are having this dialogue. I'm talking and he's he's reassured me. Yes, you've done this. Yes, you've done this. Yes, you've done this. And I'm just being completely honest and raw before God. And at the end of it, God gave me peace about it. And I was like, good, God, I have forgiven him. Now I can walk on through this. But if we're not honest with the counselor, the counselor can't help us in the process. Does that make sense? He's a wonderful counselor. Be honest with him. You know what's crazy? If you're not honest with God, you're really kind of, okay, I know children are in the room, so we won't say the word stupid. So, but if, if children weren't in the room, I would call you that. But since they're in the room, we won't say that, okay? But if you're trying to hide from God, that's what you probably are, okay? So be completely honest with the counselor. Does that make sense? Good. Number two, listen to the counselor's voice. When the counselor is speaking to you, Jesus says multiple times throughout the book of John that my sheep hear my voice. The sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd. When the counselor is speaking to you, listen to his voice. When God is guiding you and leading you, and listen, I get it. If you're not a Christian and you're not sure about this Jesus thing, you may not recognize the voice of God. But if you are a Christian, you should be able to recognize when this wonderful counselor is guiding you and helping you go somewhere. You should be able to recognize recognize his voice, which leads me to the third thing about a wonderful counselor and how do we get healing. Do what the counselor tells you to do. 
Now listen, I have been counseling for a long time and helping a lot of people. You know what one of my favorite things in the world is? Listen, this is so cool. All right, one of my favorite things in the world is when somebody sets an appointment with me and they come and they sit down in my office and they ask me for advice. Maybe it's a married couple, maybe it's an individual. They sit and they ask me for advice and I'm sitting there and I go, oh man, I'm familiar with this. I've, I've helped other couples. God's given me wisdom in this area. I've read some books about this. I've got scripture. Man, I am so excited to be able to help you. And, and in my heart, in my mind, I'm just thinking this and I'm going, man, this is so cool. And, and they're asking me and they're like, man, I really want help. And I'm like, okay, here you go. And I I just pour out and I give them just incredible advice and and they just walk out and they don't do anything that I tell them. That just thrills my heart when they don't do anything that I've told them. No, not. Listen, when, when God as a counselor, whether he's helping you through other people or he's helping you through his word or he's speaking to you in, in a small voice or whatever it may be, when he as a wonderful counselor is speaking and working in your life, do what he says. So many times, I, I remember as a kid, it was always discussed, do you know what God's will is for your life? Like it's some big thing the size of this screen that somehow one day God's going to go and reveal this, here's the will for you. What, What if God's will is for you to just do the next thing he wants you to do? You know, when I, when I talk to kids or teenagers, I tell them, this is the best time of your life. You really got one verse in the Bible to obey. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Hang on to that one. You're good. Hold on to that one. The rest of them will work out. You'll grow and you got more to obey, but start with that one. And all the parents said, Amen. see? And all the kids went, can you give us a second option? No, <laughs> just start with that one and you'll be all right. That's where you go. But listen, when God's beginning to deal with you and beginning to walk with you, the reason he's a wonderful counselor is because he wants you to do what he says. I don't know what that is. Maybe you need that kind of counselor in your life, and that's the need you have, and you'll find that in God. So let me move to the next one. Another name that Isaiah gives God and gives this coming Messiah, he says he's a wonderful counselor, and then he says he's a a mighty God. Well, what makes him a mighty God? This one's going to be kind of fun. I use a lot of S's in this, so it'll be really cool, and if you like that sort of thing, you'll have fun with it, all right? Here's the first one. What makes him a mighty God? He's the source of our power. Do you realize that you have, if you are a Christian, that you have the most incredible, the most powerful force in all the universe living inside of you? It's as if there was a boxing match that was happening and all of a sudden in the middle of that boxing match, as you stood up to get in the middle of a boxing match, the best fighter in all the world, whether you think that was Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali or whoever you think it is, at the very moment of battle, that spirit can well up inside of you. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of you is the most incredible force and power in all the universe that God, by his very word, went stars, poof, and they appeared. When God, by his very word, said, hey, ocean, stop right there. When God, by his very word, said, let's create anteaters. And he created them for, I guess, just for the kicks of it. I don't know why he made one of them. He lives inside of us. Listen, maybe you need a mighty God during this season. Maybe you need to recognize that God is the source of your power. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the scripture is not going to be up there. When God, or when Jesus is leaving this earth and he's speaking to his disciples, he said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to leave you a comforter. And he says, the Holy Spirit, I'm going to leave with you. And he's going to live inside of you. And he's going to be the source of all the power and everything that you need. He is there inside of you. He's the source of your power. Here's another S. Are you ready? He is the strength of our lives. Everybody can quote this verse. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all this through him, through Christ who gives me strength. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. He is the source of the strength that is in our lives. That's God. Do you need a mighty God during this time in your life? Do you need a God who can step up in your life? Is that the need that you have? God that can do things that you can't do. If you're depending on your own strength, then you're not depending on his strength. So he's the source of our power. He's the strength of our lives. Another S if you like him and you want to fill in blanks, all right? He secures our eternity. God's got it. 
Listen, if you're not a Christian this morning, you need to understand something. All it takes to become a Christian is to surrender. That was another S, and it's not even in here. Look at me alliterating, all right? Listen, all it takes is for you to surrender your life to Christ. It's not some magical prayer. It's not some one-time occurrence where you go, oh, dear God, I need to give you. It, it is this. It is me saying, God, I'm nothing without you, and I'm giving you my life, and here is my life, and I am going to follow you from this point on. When you give God your life, based on everything that he's taught us, based on everything that He said, when you give God your life, he takes your life, he puts it in the palm of his hand, he wraps his hand around your life, and he says, nobody can take you. And he's got you. First Peter chapter 1, Peter being one of Jesus' disciples, he wrote these words. He says, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, or never fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last times. He has got your salvation. Salvation secure in eternity forever. Do you need that kind of mighty God? I do. See, I don't know what your need is. Maybe you need the counselor. Maybe you need the mighty God. Maybe. Maybe you need the one. This is a hard one. Maybe you need the everlasting Father. See, here's something that I'm uh, really familiar with pastoring our church. There's a lot of people in our church that when you say the name daddy or you say the name father, it doesn't bring up good memories in people's minds. Listen, I, I had a good daddy. My daddy, was, he, he wasn't a perfect daddy. I had to hold the flashlight when he worked on the car. Um, anybody ever have to do that for your dad? Uh, then you know what it is to not have a perfect daddy. Right, let me go a step further. Anybody ever have to help their dad put up Christmas lights? All right, you know what it is to not have a perfect daddy, all right? If you got cussed out at Christmas time for hanging Christmas lights, there you go, all right? Um, but he was a good daddy. Um, but when you talk about dads and fathers, for a lot of people, that, that doesn't, it doesn't set well. Because a lot of people have had bad experiences. A lot of people have been left deserted or abused or hurt or... Those are just not good pictures in their minds. So when you talk about a dad or a father, that's a sore spot in church. And so much of the Bible talks about our heavenly father, and that is a difficult place. So when a prophet in the Old Testament says that this, this one to come will be an everlasting father, that may not be a place of comfort. But can I tell you how an everlasting father, not an earthly father, how an everlasting perfect father deals with his children. Again, practical information, okay? Number one, and if you got your notes, you're going to fill in the blanks, okay? He lovingly corrects us. So much of Scripture um, speaks of God loving us. And, and I, listen, good mom, good dad, I grew up in a good home. Um, we, my parents started off their journey with God in, in, in legalism. And if you don't know what legalism is, it basically teaches you a, a rule-based salvation, a rule-based life with God. I, I learned more about um, what God was against than what God was for. And man, God used those kinds of things. And I don't regret any of it. God taught me so much. But, but it was difficult. Um, I really had a, a fear of God that if anything bad happened, if I, if I had a, a, a flat tire, I thought it was because I sinned, whatever it may be. I, I really had this perspective of God that all he wanted to do was judge. I didn't have the picture of a loving, correcting God. And then God gave me children, and I realized that a good daddy lovingly corrects his children, and I got a picture of who God really was. And a loving, everlasting father lovingly corrects. He lovingly guides back. Those of you that are parents this morning, have you ever been on a hike with one of your children who likes to vary off of the path just a little bit? Any parents in here in the room? 
All right, you're with me? You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kid that the path is very well laid out right in front of the path, maybe four foot wide, and somebody has taken a very good job in cutting that path out. But for some reason, your kid can see every squirrel, every rock, every limb that might or might not be a snake, every single thing that sits off the side of the path. Your kid sees a path and does one of these numbers everywhere you go. Anybody identify with that? Now, do you take your kid and tie them to your back and not let them loose? If you do, don't raise your hand. A loving parent guides the child back to the path. Sometimes with stronger language than others. But guides them back. That's what our Heavenly Father, that's what an everlasting Father does. He lovingly corrects us. Number two, He provides for our needs. Uh, the Bible speaks in so many different places about a dad who doesn't provide for his children is, is the worst kind of person um, he also speaks that we have a heavenly father who knows the number of hairs on our heads. And for some of us, it's getting easier for God to count. But he does. The Bible speaks that he knows the sparrow that falls from the sky. And if he knows that, how much more does he take care of us? He provides for our needs. The third one is he gives us wisdom. We help our kids learn life skills and encourage them and their gifts and their talents and every step that they take. Matter of fact, the verse in, in Proverbs that says, train up a child in the way they'll go and when they're old they won't depart from it. That, that is not some, some uh, uh, false accusation that if you teach your kids John 3.16 and they rebel that one day they're going to come back. That's not what that means. What that actually means is that you need to set your kids on a particular wheel track. Think of an old western that you've seen on TV somewhere along the way and the wheel tracks from the wagon would get in a particular wheel track and as long as you stay in those wheel tracks you're safe and you're okay as parents we put our kids in a particular wheel track and we try to keep them safe and we impart wisdom to them we learn what their gifts are we learn what their abilities are yes we impart biblical wisdom to them and we give them truth along the way but we try to keep them along that well our everlasting father our God he gives us his wisdom as we grow closer and closer and closer to him and the fourth one, which is my favorite thing about an everlasting father, is um, he always, always welcomes us back. Always. A couple of weeks ago in, um, in my quiet time, I was uh, just reading different scriptures and um, I, I came across the story of the prodigal son. If you're familiar with the story of the prodigal son, say I'm familiar. Okay, good. You're familiar. Good. Some of you may not be. It's a story in the book of Luke that Jesus tells, and he's, he's talking to a group that he's trying to convince them that, that they may be the older brother or they may be the younger brother. But the story goes about a father who has two sons. His, his older son seems to be loyal, but he's not very forgiving. The younger son comes to his father and says, Dad, um, give me my inheritance. I want my money now. The father says, and that's not a good idea, but eventually he says, yes, son, I'll give you your money. We know the story. It's kind of abbreviated, but it's along the lines of the younger son takes his money and he goes and he spends it and he, he wastes it and he, he lives it on the kind of life that he shouldn't be living it on. And eventually he spent all the money. He's lost all of his friends and he's working in a pigsty, cleaning out a pigsty and he goes there for his food. There's a famine in the land. He's thinking, I've got to go back to my father. When I was studying this or reading it in my quiet time a few weeks ago, I ran across a, a commentary, a, a guy who wrote this. And I'd never, I'd never read this before in all the times I've read or taught this and it was cool and, and I think it's pretty accurate so I'm going to share it with you and hopefully you'll, you'll see it and maybe you'll see it for the first time. Um, the story of the prodigal son is that the father, uh, the father in the story, when he sees his son from a distance off, he runs to his son. He was waiting for his son to come home and he runs to him and greets him and brings him home. The particular commentator that I was reading about this gave an interesting uh, commentary of it. He said that in those days, and Jesus would have known this because Jesus lived in those days, obviously, and he was telling the story of this. In most of the towns in those days, the men would gather every day at the, the gate or the city, uh, the, the, uh, the, the gate of the city, and that's where a lot of the decisions were made. And you can follow that line of thinking throughout Scripture, that men would gather, and that was kind of the judge and the rulers of the city and the elders of the city would gather every day, and they would make decisions for the city, whatever it would be made. Well, in a in that particular time and that particular way of dealing things, when a son, a family member, was leaving and deserted his family, the men of the city, as 
they were sitting, if they saw that son coming back to the city, they would be the ones who would step up and they would pronounce judgment on that son and not allow him back in the city. They would be the one who would pronounce a curse and say, your father will not allow you to come back home. You are nothing to him. So after I read that, I got another mental picture of a father looking for his son. Not looking for his son so he could just go give him a hug, but a father saying, there are people that are waiting to judge you. There are people that are waiting to tell you that I won't forgive you. There are people that are waiting to say, you're not worth anything. So I'm going to take my robe and I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to tuck it in and I'm going to run and I'm going to greet you while you're outside of the city before people can pronounce judgment on you and I'm going to get to you and I'm going to throw my robe around you and I'm going to bring you into the city and say, you're not going to judge him because that's my boy. That's a cool picture. You see, an everlasting father always welcomes us back. Maybe that's what you need this morning. I remember, I don't know what your need is. You do. Maybe you don't, but God does. Maybe you need that wonderful counselor in your life. Maybe you need that mighty God. Maybe your need is an everlasting father. Or maybe it's the final one that Isaiah prophesies that Jesus will be known as, and that's the Prince of Peace. Let me give you a couple of things about the Prince of Peace. What does that peace look like? It's a peace that comforts us. In John 14, 27, Jesus speaking to his disciples not long before he leaves this earth, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. It's a peace that comforts us. I didn't think of it until this morning, but when I was praying and thinking about the message and how I wanted to present and everything again this morning, I, the word peace, uh, several years ago, uh, it hadn't been that long ago, I don't guess, but um, we had a young guy on our, our worship team here at our church. His, his name was Tyler Thomas. Um, Tyler played bass for us, 24, 25 years old. I can't remember exactly how old he was. Um, Tyler used to play bass right back over here. Um, Tyler uh, contracted a, a really rare lung disease. Uh, nobody could figure it out. Saw doctors for well over a year. Was in and out of the hospital multiple times. But always wanted to be here serving. So he would come in and ultimately had to be put on oxygen. And he would come in and would wheel an oxygen tank out and sit it back here next to a stool. And we'd bring his bass out and put it around his shoulders. And he'd sit there and play bass for our worship band with an oxygen tank. And then we'd help him get off the stage so that he could worship and help lead worship. Um, ended up getting married um, to, his, uh, to his bride. And Tyler, he got transferred to uh, Chapel Hill, to UNC Chapel Hill, and uh, was hoping for a lung transplant. And when he got transferred up there, uh, one of our associate pastors and I went to, to go see him and hung out. And things weren't looking really good. Um, we went up there, we, we hung out, and we decided to just spend the night. The next morning, really, really, really early in the morning, his wife called me and she said, Tyler's in a panic, things aren't good. So I drove back up to the hospital, and it really wasn't. Tyler's, um, the blood counts were going crazy, things weren't going well. Um, anyway, I'm, to make it as short as possible, Tyler contracted some sort of uh, bacteria that was not going to allow him to live. He immediately went off the lung transplant list and got moved into the ICU. His family gathered around. And over the next day, uh, it got really ugly really quick. And again, I'm not trying to be over dramatic. It's just where God's spoken to me. Um, in and out of his room in the ICU, um, family gathered around. There was a moment where he asked me to just be in the room with he and his bride. They'd only been married a few months. And we prayed together and we cried together and we talked. And he said, Tony, what am I supposed to do? And remember I said I was a pretty good counselor. I'd never been through this before. And I was just sitting there going, I need a wonderful counselor right now. And the only word I could come up with for Tyler was peace. And I said, Tyler, you need peace more than anything else right now. And I don't know how to give it to you, but let's pray for it. And he said, okay. So we prayed. 
held his hand, held his wife's hand, and we prayed for peace. We cried together. I left the room. Family members came in. We knew that it was just a, a matter of a few minutes before Tyler was going to go on. Uh, he asked one of the doctors if I could come into the room with his family. I went into the room with his family, and uh, I stood at the foot of the bed, and I just grabbed a hold of his foot. And uh, as he was, everybody was saying their goodbyes, and Tyler looked down at the end of the bed and just locked eyes with me. And I said, hey, buddy, I love you. He nodded. I said, tell me what you're thinking. And he went, peace. That's the kind of peace that God can provide. Maybe that's what you need during this season. The kind of peace that comforts. Paul says in his writings that it's a peace that passes all understanding. Do you know what a peace that passes all understanding means? It means that I can't understand it. I wish I could get more technical with that, but I think that's where it sits. And maybe that's what you need, a peace that comforts. The last thing about this peace, not only is it a peace that comforts, but it's a peace that saves. Paul says in Romans 5, he says these words. He says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then I couldn't help but use a verse in Ephesians since we had just finished that series Ephesians 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away from, were far away, have been brought near through the blood of Christ, for Christ himself is our peace. What do you need this Christmas season? See, the names of God are all throughout the Bible. They're there on purpose. They speak to our needs. I don't know what you need. Do you need that wonderful counselor this time of the year? Do you need a mighty God to step in and do things that you can't do? Are you dependent on your own strength and you need his strength? Do you need that everlasting father in your life? Do you need peace? In the book of Matthew, a prophecy is fulfilled. Behold, a virgin will conceive and you will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Whatever your need is, whatever it is, it's one name, Jesus. That's where you're going to find it. So this week, here's what I want you to do. There's no big, huge statement at the end. There's just this. Whatever that need is, my prayer is, is that you're going to walk out of here today and say, man, that's what I needed. If you need the wonderful counselor, he's there for you. Find a place to get alone this week and just be honest with him. Tell him what your needs are. He knows. He just wants you to talk to him. If you need a mighty God, if you've been depending on your own strength, take that mighty God and depend on him. If you need the everlasting father, if you need that good daddy, Find that spot. Get with him. If you need peace, he's the prince of it. Find him this week. If we can help you in any way here at Living Water, we're here for you. We want to help you find this one we call Jesus. God, I love you this morning. Thank you that we can speak your word, that we can speak it with truth. God, I pray that you will use the words that were spoken today. God, I pray that you will take them, put them in people's hearts, I pray, God, that if there is anyone here today that is walking a distance from you, that you will nudge them onto the path, bring them to you, let them find that you are all these names, all wrapped in one, and that you are our God, our everlasting Father, our wonderful Counselor, our mighty God, and our Prince of Peace. We trust you. We love you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.